Welcome to This Is Real Life with Jen Blossom, where we talk all things that make us most uncomfortable. From abuse to addiction and trauma to recovery, nothing is off limits. My guests and I will expose the parts of ourselves that hold the most pain and share the freedom that is possible. This is real life. Well, we are back on with our bravest contestant yet. <laughs> How is it going over there in uh, in a COVID world? I know. Honestly, I was so excited to record just so that we could talk and it would feel like I was having a conversation with a real life human, not my kids or my husband, which I love, but. You know, I try to explain that. It's like my husband, like he's still working, but he's working at, out of the house. And it's like, you have adult conversations all the time. Like, so even though you're like stuck in the house, like you're still having adult, like I don't have any adult conversations. Like it's driving me insane. Cause even if I pick up the phone to call you, we both would have our kids hanging off yes. our legs. Right. Yes. So this is like the perfect opportunity to kind of like hang out. And you know, it's like a great excuse to Chit-chat. Yeah, like my shower this morning, which it consisted of me, my two children, and my dog. Perfect. That's, I love, a, sh- that's a shower. I love how they, yeah, appreciate our 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 physical boundaries. I know. Um, okay, so truth be told, we um, recorded your very first podcast, so the beginning of your story on sexual abuse and recovery. Um, weeks and weeks ago. So we did that in person and we did it a long time ago. It didn't even hit the market, the market didn't even hit the airwaves, I guess you could say um, until last week because there was just so much going on. Um, And we wanted to make sure that you were prepared, that your heart was prepared to actually send it live. How was that for you? So, you know, because I called you frantically a few times, I just had so much fear circling around sharing my story and worrying what people would think about me or worrying that it would be used against me. And I really had to pray that away and just realize that it doesn't matter about the people that won't like it. What does matter is the people that it will be able to impact or the people that will call me, which there have been so many people that are going to say, this impacted my life. Me too. I felt the same way. When you said this, it resonated with my heart because I felt this trauma. And then I realized, oh, everything that I went through was not for nothing. It was to reach so many other, I don't want to call them victims, but so many other people who need survivors, yeah, who need to overcome trauma. That's right. I always say that this isn't for the person who is just wanting to like find things out about people. This is for the person who's been there and is looking for hope and comfort and community in their own trauma. So again, like, you know, and and listen, here's the thing. There is just always going to be someone out there who just doesn't like you. And that just is life. And them not yeah. liking you actually says more about them than it says about you. So let's just let it be, right? I mean, I always thought to myself, if one person could hear my story and 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 find a nugget of goodness from it, then it was all worth it. Yeah. And that's how it has been, honestly, since so what is the Thursday. Uh, so much feedback. Some people I know, some people I don't know, sharing their own stories. Um people from high school saying, I'm sorry that I didn't support you more. Um, People from high school saying, I didn't even know about this. I Mm -hmm. can't believe it. It's crazy. A lot of different things. But But they've all been, they've all been, see, that's the thing about sharing. We're taught to keep it quiet because it will be embarrassing. And the, the pain of the embarrassment would be too much to bear. When actuality when you're sharing with a you know a, an adult audience, which I'm assuming these are adults that are listening, <laughs> correct. Um, but for the most part, 
people are just grateful for your, for your vulnerability. Yeah. And I love, I love that we're able to kind of provide that through our stories. So I wanted to just shout out, make a, another kind of a little announcement that April is sexual assault and sexual abuse awareness month. And so I wanted to throw out some statistics before we get on to the rest of your story. Um, the first stat and listen, all stats, depending on who, where, where you go, I mean, they all kind of change. So I kind of, you know, just, that's my little forewarning, but right. one in five women in the U S have experienced rape or attempted rape at some point in their lives. One in five, right. one in 67 men in the United States have experienced rape or attempted rape at some point in their lives. Only five out of every 1,000 perpetrators will end up in prison. The majority of sexual assault happens by someone you know. Rape is the most underreported crime. Every 73 seconds, an American is sexually assaulted. Every nine minutes, an American child is sexually assaulted. That one was like, oh my God. You know, what? Crazy. Nine minutes. One in four women have been sexually abused in their life. One in four women. Listen to that. So if we're in a room and we're like at a dinner table with four women, one of them has been sexually abused statistically. Right. Isn't that ridiculous? And one out of six men have been sexually abused in their lifetime. Well, because so many people hear my story and they're like, this is crazy. I can't believe this is happening. And it yeah, is it's the happening. People that weren't sexually abused saying that. <laughs> yeah. It's like, because, you know, it's a, it's a, you know, we talked about this. It's a very, sh- sexual abuse is a shameful yes. guilt. Like, it's a weird, weird type of abuse. I feel like, not that there's like a good abuse, but like physical abuse, like you can see, like you can prove it, right? You're like, see this black eye? Like, I got hit in the face. Where like emotional abuse, verbal abuse, and um, sexual abuse, you can't see. It's so hard, but I'm, I'm grateful for you who is honest enough to really share in detail your experience because I think it is so powerful. Um, so you got some, you got the feedback you got was like, Hey, I relate to you. Hey, I'm sorry that this happened. Hey, wow. I had no idea. Hey, you know, this is my story out to you. A bunch of stories that just mm. broke my heart that mm. just made me wish we weren't in quarantine and I could go hug those people. I know. I know. Um, because I get it. Yeah. And, and now I have a community of people that I can say, I get it. You can yes. talk to me about this. And I want to mm. say that again, if you are listening to this and you've suffered any type of abuse, any type of trauma, and you need someone to talk to and guide you through some healing process or tell you some good therapist to go to, call me, reach out to yeah. me on social media. The, cool. Yeah, I was, and it's, sh- oh, and it's not judgmental because you've been there, done that, right? I mean, it's very, it's a safe, it's safe to, to find people who have been there, done that um, because they get it. Yep. It makes it safe. So, okay. So long story short, to catch everybody up, we talked to um, Susana about her childhood, about the abuse, um, the sexual abuse that she um, endured, and we got all the way up to getting married um, and telling your husband about the abuse. And we had talked about how you had mentioned to him like a handful of times, like this is what happened, but like there was never any like need to clarify anything like um, he didn't ask you like clarifying questions or anything like that. It was just like, oh, yeah, she's been sexually assaulted or abused. So um, you mentioned that you then went to therapy and that a lot of the trauma that had been kind of uh, minimized came to the surface and it really brought a lot of it to light. I, I think that maybe we could start right there. Okay. Um, so we really, really at this point had to do the work. Yeah. It was... It was a really raw and vulnerable time for both of us because we How had done a lot of, um, I think I was 24 at this point and he's, he was 27. Got it. We had done a lot of damage with our words. We had really hurt each other because we were broken and our sex life wasn't where we wanted it to be. We were comparing e- each other with past partners and it was just really damaging 
for yeah. both of us. So we had a lot mm-hmm. of work to do. And it's, I wanted to share this because the day after our Friday morning, this fr- week, after my story went live, I got this just, you know, basic meditation from Henry Now, and he's one of my favorite uh, philosophers. He's a Catholic priest who has since passed, but it said, how are we healed of our wounding memories? We are healed first but of all by letting them be available, by leading them out of the corner of forgetfulness, and by remembering them as part of our life stories. What is forgotten is unavailable, and what is unavailable cannot be healed. By lifting our painful, forgotten memories out of the egocentric, individualistic, private sphere, Jesus Christ heals our pain. He connects them with the pain of all humanity, a pain he took upon himself and transformed. To heal, then, does not primarily mean to take pains away, but to reveal that our pains are part of a great pain that our sorrows are part of a great sorrow, that our experience is part of the great experience of him who said, but was it not ordained that the Christ should suffer and so enter into the glory of God? And for me, it was just confirmation that what I'm sharing is the right thing to be doing. And that is really the work that we put in. When Matt and I both shared past traumas and pain, in therapy together, we were able to mourn for each other. Mm -hmm. Matt was able to mourn with me, was able to help carry those burdens that we're not meant to carry alone. That's right. I had been holding it in as part of my story. It has nothing to do with anyone else. This is just me. But then I got married and it was no longer just me. Exactly. And my pain and my shame and my the ways that I had been hurt were affecting my partner and my sex life and my marriage. Yes. And if I wanted it to succeed, I had to fast track, get healthy quick. Mm-hmm. Luckily, we had this amazing sex therapist who the first well, thing... So that, wait, when you went to therapy, it was like a sex therapist? She like, was Not a like a marriage therapist. or family therapist, like a sex therapist? So she, I found her, she was in, uh, wrote an article in Psychology Today. And I was like, okay, we have to have the best person. We're going to find this person. So Matt and I had made this pact that our if our sex life was bad, because we didn't have sex before we got married, but we both had been sexually active. Mm-hmm. So that was difficult. We, we really never did some of the exploring that other couples would have done. That's right. Sexually. Mm-hmm. And so I was, we made a pact that if two months in, it wasn't good, we were going to go to therapy. Wow. And it was bad. So <laughs> so we went. I think yeah. we went four months in. We tried talking to a couple that was really, really helpful from Mock Harbor. We went to a couple classes at this exact same time. We did Becoming One at Rock Harbor. Oh my gosh, we did two. Oh, fun. Yeah, we did it with Stephanie Mack. And yeah, Doug. so we did it the series after them because oh Rhonda God. and Bob were... Uh, well, that's teaching so it. Cool. That's so they're, cool. I know. They're amazing. So um, I know. It was a wonderful class. So we were doing all of these things simultaneously, mm-hmm. doing whatever we could. Okay, we are, we're going to make this work. That's right. We're, how, what are we going to do? And so we're in therapy with this woman who it specifically works with people who have couple therapy, but specifically couples who have had sexual abu- abuse in their childhood. Okay. So this is like to a T exactly what we're dealing with. That's right. So she was really helpful. Um, She also explained to me why there were, I mean, it's not like my sex life was great with before marriage, but it wasn't as difficult as it was in marriage. And she explained that the baggage that comes along with a, a lifelong commitment is why sex is so different in marriage. Mm, That's interesting. Right? And that's why it felt so real and so vulnerable and so painful and why I couldn't even allow my husband to touch me and I felt crazy for that. And then it was like, well, am I just not sexually attracted to him? Are we just not sexually compatible? All these things going through Mm. my mind. So she made us start from the beginning 
which was really, really a good idea. We had to learn how to trust each other with trust touches. We would touch each other's hands and feet and we weren't allowed to have sex. I think it was like two or three weeks wow. in therapy. Married, we're married here and we're not allowed to have sex. Okay. And um, I, I had to really work through a lot of my issues. I had some issues with being you know, on the bottom, being held down, not being in a place, a a position of power, being in a position where I could escape if I needed to. That makes so much sense. I would assume that would be kind of a trigger for you. Yeah, it was. It was a trigger. How do you, that's, you know what, that's a good point. How do you associate pleasure from something that you've always had be unpleasurable? That's an interesting thought. So I didn't know if I was going to go into this, but I should, because I should just be real about everything. Who cares? Um, I still struggle with, um, oral pleasure by my husband and we've been married 11 years. I could see that. The one time he tried, I probably traumatized him. I was just (laughs) bawling my eyes out. Right. He's like, is it that bad? (laughs) Yeah. So, so there's, that's an example of damage. That happens, oh, 100%. and and of right. course they want to please, and then yes. I would hurt him with my words because I didn't know how to defend myself. So it would be like, "Well, you're just horrible at this," right. and it was so damaging. I don't even know how we got to the point where we are, but I know it took a lot of work. I know that when we did get pregnant. Where we th- were like, okay, we're okay. We could try getting pregnant now. We were at a place in our marriage where we felt really healthy. And we felt, and it was about four years in. Got it. Tons of different therapy. There were so many different things that both of us discovered about our past that affected our marriage, which I I'm think. I'm so proud of you guys. You know why? Because if you don't put in the work early, you're going to put it in later. So you're going you're gonna to have to put in work regardless. And I'm just proud of you for doing it when you, you know, in the oh, beginning rather than like yes. midlife crisis, you know? Well, that's why nothing now seems that big of a deal because we dealt with it. We yeah. already went through all that. We went through our midlife crisis mid-20s. <laughs> that's right. So we're like, oh yeah, quarantine, we'll, we're fine. <laughs> like, yeah. I'm no money, so it'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> right. Like, like what's bad? Like what's really that bad? Right. I mean, when you've been through some crazy stuff, it's like, eh. Yeah. Part of the therapy that was really interesting for me was learning how my body worked. Mm. And I'm sure, you know, growing up in kind of, I don't know, or once you become a Christian, it's almost like your body is shameful as it is. No. Don't it look is at your body. Even... Don't touch your body. Right. Yeah, I think that, um, well, I grew up and I guess I could add this in, which is something that I've never told anybody before, but here we are. Thank you. Um, I think growing up, I wasn't ever allowed to be happy um, or like have, like if anything good happened to me, it gave my mother a reason to pick at me. If that makes any sense. Yeah. Um, And so I think that translates even into like other things, including sex. Like, who are you to be pleasured? Like, who do you think you are? Why do you deserve this? What did you do to, you know? I mean, she was just so awful in her, in her just deal, like living and, you know, just being with me. Like anytime I smiled, it was like, why are you smiling? Um, so for me, I think that that translates into all parts of your life. Like then people start being nice to you or you start being happy or you start getting pleasure and it's like, you feel bad for it. You feel bad about it. Cause that was your like initial idea. It was the initial idea given to you by your caregiver. So, and that again, and I'm throwing that out there just because of sex. And I think that for me, like the sex is different once you heal all of your trauma not just the trauma part, right? Like not just emotionally do you feel better and mentally, but like all parts of who you are get better when you start to uncover and reveal the parts of yourself that were so, you know, traumatized, if that makes sense. Right. 
And I'm so, so and sorry yeah, and so, she but did that. Growing oh. up with my dad being a youth pastor, which is a whole nother story. Yeah. Um, he ended up dying. Um, f- uh, how, how long ago? Six years ago um, of alcoholism. So that's a whole, whole crazy story. But um, yeah. you end up assuming, okay, God is perfect. You like all the things that are actually true about the Christian faith as a child are very, um, confusing. And so, yeah, your body, you don't show off your body. You don't walk like you, you, you kind of cover up You're humble, right? Like, um, it, and the Bible kind of, it makes it feel like, oh no, sex is just for the husband's enjoyment. You know, it, it's hard until, cause you don't really understand it. And now you're an adult and you can understand the Bible more, but like back then it was very, it was very hard to understand. So I, I absolutely get the whole shame thing, especially having sex before marriage. It's You feel so guilty. And then all of a sudden you have a ring on your finger and it's like, we're supposed to be so happy about this. And it's supposed to be so fun all the time. It's a very confusing thing, sex is and, and religion. Oh, I literally believed that because a bunch of people had told me this, that God would bless my sex life because we chose not to have sex before we got married. And in my mind, bless your sex life means it's going to be it's so fun, the world. so amazing, so <laughs> sexy, where it, in reality, we were just like blundering in the dark. Oh, we were gosh, so that's... different. We didn't know who we were. And when yeah, before that's... this, like Christ, Christian teaching is, I mean, and this is just the way I interpreted it. Sex is so wonderful, but it's really bad. But save it for the one that you love. It just felt like this roller coaster. Yeah. And it was and now so that I'm confusing. Older, now that I'm older and a little bit wiser and a little bit less, I don't know, a little bit more, you know, calloused, a little bit more roughed up. I, I, all sex, sexual, all things. So like you yeah, should sexual be- immorality. You say, right. Like you, th- all those things are going to harm the marriage bet- or the, the sex between a man and a woman, but we, they don't talk about that in the Bible, right? It just says, don't do this. Don't do that. Don't do this. It doesn't say, and if you were the victim of somebody who did do this to you, this is what you should do. You know, like that, that part's really missing out. I think. Yeah. No one talks about that part. Right. Which is why we're talking about it. Yep. Here we are because here no one wants are. to say say that this this kind of the basis part of human nature could ever exist because it's so disgusting it's so depraved it's it's horrible and it's a cycle of abuse that keeps happening and unless yeah, we talk girl, about it unless you better we not like it, it that much right like sex in general right it's like you have these two types of thoughts like oh the christian woman like she just she's so eloquent in her sex life right and then there's like the other view that's like, you better like moan and <laughs> pretend yeah. it's amazing the whole time. You know, no one talks about like the realities of what sex really is. And I think that, man, we could do a whole other podcast and we probably should. Maybe we should do a sex ed podcast one of these sex days. Sexversations. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm, I've am i never been from the school of thought that I should fake it because that's just not my personality. Yeah. So, but that also hindered my marriage sex life. Because I was just like, nope, this is bad. This sucks. I hate it. What's yeah, the point like of her. being married if we're going to have a bad sex life forever? Right. Because to so me, it was... It, it sounds to me, though, that the therapy was really helpful because it really boiled down to trust, right? Like with those mm-hmm. trust exercises, like really knowing that like my husband really actually loves me and cares about me and wants the best for me. Like... Would you assume that that was really the turning point? Yes. So, and that's a really good point. I did not really, this is such a weird thing to say, but up until I gave birth to my son, I still had in the back of my mind that my marriage could be temporary. I threw around the word divorce often, which I shouldn't have had, shouldn't wow. have. That was very damaging and hurt my husband deeply. Yeah. And the and it wasn't about him. It was about me. Because deep down I still had this shame and this feeling that I wasn't good enough and that one day he would figure it all out and he would figure out how messed up I was and he would be sick of it and he'd be done with me. And then I would be exactly where I thought I would always be. 
So Which, sorry, it's so weird. No, I mean that's the um, oh geez, what is the word? A self, a self um, preservation. No, when you like ruin things for yourself. Oh man, I wish I had a brain. Self, people are going to be listening, being like, "Ah, this is the word." Like self, you know, like when you ruin things for yourself because you don't believe your self sabotage. Who? Ding ding ding. Yes. Yes. (laughs) No, but like for real, like you don't. You're. you're, Yeah. It's never a conscious choice to self sabotage. It's typically an unconscious, just like way of behaving. I guess that okay. leads you to the path which you believe you deserve. And so and I you, was the queen of that. Right. And a even lot when we were dating, like the every child, yeah, the inner child and all of us that were abused do not feel like as if we deserve good things or shame. No. Things. And I didn't even really think I deserved my husband when we were dating. I mean, I called off our wedding three months before our wedding. I oh was the queen gosh. of self-sabotage. When we were dating, I tried to break up with him every single month. It was usually when I was on my period. Um, and <laughs> like doing it again. And Matt, we're doing this again. <laughs> yeah. And Matt would be like, okay, I understand this isn't about me and that you have a lot of daddy issues and you're afraid I'm going to eventually leave you, but I'm not going to leave you and you're not allowed to leave me and we're going to be together forever. And it's, that's just the way it is. And I'd be like, Mm. oh, okay. All right. Okay. He was the perfect person for me. Can we talk about your wedding for a second? Um, Who was invited? Everybody was invited to my wedding. Um, Even better? Yes. So I invited my sister. Your dad? I invited my dad. Actually, I told my dad. Um, I mean, we've talked about this after, but I told my dad it would be a great time to kind of clear the slate. That if he came, that we could just pretend like the past never happened and move forward from there. I didn't ask him to walk me down the aisle, obviously, but I did invite him. Did you um, walk yourself down the aisle? I had my mom walk me down the aisle. My mom, you know, even though we've had our differences, I know she did her best taking care of me and Mm -hmm. she really deserves the credit because even if she couldn't be there for me, she placed really good people in my life, good Mm -hmm. examples, um, a lot of awesome humans that helped me, guide me, and that were there for me. That's awesome. I mean, that's, it's huge to have people in your life, even if they're not your parents, people who can speak truth into you. But so did your dad end up coming? No. So my dad never came, never showed. I actually left a spot open in my wedding party just in case my sister showed randomly. Like your sister didn't show and your dad didn't show. Right. No one, they didn't either. In your face. Like after all that. Yeah. Golly. Yeah. Yeah. It was devastating. It was devastating. It was, I still had a really wonderful day, but I did hold hope, you know, that she would be there. But it was it was so beautiful. <laughs> it's so interesting because the entire audience was crying as I walked down the aisle. And it wasn't because, like, it was just so beautiful and mo- moving. It was because no one really thought I was going to make it. <laughs> like, people, people that knew me from my childhood, like, were like... There's no way this girl's going to end up not a statistic. <laughs> and so I think everyone was That's so your wedding. <laughs> yeah, so everyone was so shocked and I heard this from my godmother who has since passed that she just really never thought I would get married. <laughs> and she just That's never like, thought like, like me doing the right the thing that you're supposed to do like go to college, get married, well, you know, <laughs> the things that are supposedly what you're supposed to do in society which I am not saying that that's what you have to do. I just happen to do it in that, (laughs) that path. I don't necessarily think that that's the right path, but in some, to some people in society, that is the right path. And it was shocking for people that that you of all people would do it that way. Yeah. 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 So it was really interesting. Like all my family, everyone just crying. Like, what is this really happening? Susanna is getting married to this wonderful guy. What? (laughs) So, okay, I want to get to um, you. So the wedding, because listen, my wedding was really hard for me. 
Oh my gosh. And that's a whole other story. So it's like, it's supposed to be the happiest day of your life, but the people that come to your wedding oftentimes carry the most pain (laughs) with them and you, if that makes sense. Like you're inviting the people in your life I guess if, if it's family members who've, you know, been, you know, been harmful to you, you invite them to your wedding because that's what you're supposed to do. Um, and Which I was I'm so probably it. blessed that my people didn't show. Right. Honestly. I know. Yeah. Which is so weird, you know, because it's about, you're supposed to, everybody's supposed to come and want to be there and then they don't show and you're like half happy that they're not there. And then you're like, it reminds you that how shitty your childhood was and, you know. Anyways, it's a really kind yeah. Of no, I I so it's interesting because I have talked to my dad about it, and he said that he felt like he didn't want to add any distractions to my day, so he opted not to come. And of okay. course, I I retorted with, "Well, you could have just let me know. You could have not no showed. You could have said, Susanna, I'm not going to come because I think that would be best for you. But it's fine. And yeah. At my wedding, I didn't have a father-daughter dance. And that was the biggest thing. My whole life growing up, I would always cry at that part in movies when there would be the girl dancing with her father. Mm -hmm. And it would just break my heart. I'm like, I'm never going to have that. Like, I'm never going to have the father-daughter dance. Yeah. You know what's so funny, though? It's not funny. That's really kind of really sad. But um, my father-daughter dance, because at that point, I didn't know he was an alcoholic, but like he had completely stopped all kinds of like communication and relationship with me. He was probably in the depths of his addiction at that point, but I didn't have, like I always wanted that father daughter dance too. And then it came and it felt like it was an obligation. Like I had to do it and it sucked. Like it sucked. It was like, really? I have now I have to put on a face and like, and pretend that this is a, like means something to me when really it's just fucking awkward, you know, like it sucks. that's when you come to that realization that this parent that you're hoping to have is really this fantasy that you created in your mind Dang and your it. father can never be the a father, the yeah. one that you really want. I'm literally but, getting so angry just talking about it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, part it, of me is still a little triggered. Um, well, and you still, that, that, I mean, cause pain is real all the time. It lasts forever. My yeah. husband chose not to have a mother son dance just to help me feel better about that. Oh my gosh, what a gem. I know. Well, he it, if you know his personality, it kind of makes sense. He really hates any type of attention. So, oh, okay, so he, it worked out. We just had like a full party at our reception. There were no dances. We did a first dance and that was it. Like okay. first so dance. Kind of did a little bit differently. Yeah. Like two um, speeches and party. Well, I like a good party. Um, yes. Yes. So it was fun. That, that was probably a good idea. Um, okay. So let's go. I, I, I want to make sure that we hit all the like important yes. parts. Um, how was it being, how was it getting pregnant and knowing that you were going to be a mom? Okay. So that was the next phase. Um, we obviously did all this work sexually. Um, I didn't talk about how my sex therapist encouraged me to use a pelvic floor educator, which is something that was so Mm -hmm. foreign and bizarre to me that I really needed to floor educator. Yes. So it's this, this little thing that you stick inside your vulva Okay. and you has a little antenna. And then when you are contracting properly and doing kegels the proper way, the antenna will go down. So she taught me to kind of be empowered, self-empowered. Wait, to... hold on. Do you buy this on Amazon? Where do you buy this? <laughs> it's actually a tool for people with incontinence. Perfect. In- is that the word? Yeah. yeah. Where you? Um, yes, you pee. Okay. Pelvic floor educator. Write this yeah, down, so family. Look this up. There's other tools that I've found. I feel like I sh- I I want to be a sex therapist now. Um, they're like these little balls that you can put in to really strengthen and enhance Wait, can, your okay, listen, orgasm. This is, this is for sure. We're having an episode three with you and you're going to be About our sex, sex therapist. Oh, you got it. Self, okay. Self-proclaimed self sex therapist. I really am passionate about this, actually. I yeah, think that it. women and men should have really good sex lives. Like I, yeah. And that's kind of where I was and why I was so disappointed because if I'm not like having awesome sex, I didn't want to be married, which is so, <laughs> so sad. 
But that's how I felt. And I am so grateful that we have found that place because okay, well, for I'm gonna, me, my, it's one of my love languages. It's important great. to me. Well, it's one of Jeremy's, so I better get on this pelvic floor educator. Get it. The thing is, it just teaches you how to have power over your internal orgasms. Um, there's a really great episode that people, I'll, I'll talk about that later. Okay. So anyways, um, we get to this point four years or maybe it was three, three and a few months, years of tons of therapy, Matt and I both in and out. Mm -hmm. Um, and we moved to LA area. Well, Ventura County, Thousand Oaks, mm -hmm. Westlake Village area for a couple years, which was really interesting for our marriage because we had to rely on each other. I'm an extrovert. He's an introvert. And I didn't have all of my best buddies to hang out with all the time. So we really had to strengthen our bond and deal with a lot of communication issues, mm -hmm. um, which was very healing for both of us. And uh, then we decided okay, I think we are at a safe place. We have a peaceful home environment. We know how to fight properly. We don't call each other names. We have a good sex life. We can get pregnant now. We can add another life we to this We don't home. call each other names. We can get pregnant now. <laughs> well, that's what it felt like because there was no inside of me. I didn't want to have kids yeah. because I just assumed that I would fuck them up. Yes. Sorry for no, the I am the thing. You know what? It's so crazy. It's like... And that is very common in children or in um, adults who've had who had traumatic childhoods. They have a hard time because listen, you're re you're basically reliving that crazy time, right? Like crap. Now I have to do this. Why would I choose that, right? I mean, and it's so true. I really I mean, want to do this to children. And I I never thought I was going to abuse my children, um, but I just didn't. It just I think it I think that was my self just trying to preserve. Um, the point in my life that I had already gotten, I didn't want to have to go back to the childhood part, which you're basically reliving once you have children. Yeah. Well, it's fear. Mm -hmm. I mean, fear oh, yeah. is what holds us from that. I had a lot of thoughts that possibly I was going to go crazy one day, like my sister. Mm -hmm. Um, I didn't think I could ever had the ability to abuse. I have heard mm -hmm. that statistic. I have seen that in women that I volunteered with. Oh, well, um, I, know, I actually wanted to talk about that. Um, the statistic that 50% of children who are abused become abusers. Was that the statistic you were talking about? Yeah, that they that, that are abused, abused others. Right. So um, interestingly enough, because I was having this conversation because I thought that that what we need to um, define here is children. So when you have been abused as a child, it doesn't mean that half of those children become adults that abuse. That's not what the statistic says. No. The statistic is if you are a child and you have been abused as a child, if you are still a child, there is the half of those children abuse other children when they're Correct. children. Right. So I think the the um, statistic kind of, um, you know, like that's not you. You're you're an adult now. You you know you know better. You're you know, it's it's a totally different statistic being an adult child of sexual abuse rather than being a child child. Of and actually, abuse. the the which I didn't know until I researched it. The statistic of adults who then abuse children later on in life. So if they if you were a child. Um, it's really low. Yeah. Like, like 7% of those people, yeah. um, yeah. something super small. And there's probably something else there. There's, you know, a personality disorder or something yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah. Totally. But it's not really, it's not the same thing. Yeah, Unfortunately, it's, it's still friends. just as damaging, but right. Yeah. So I had that fear just inside me because I'd heard it and I've met actual women who have abused or thought about abusing when I worked with grandma's house of hope, women, a woman shelter and sex trafficking victims. So I was, I mean, that was in the back of my mind, but I did come to terms with the fact that could never be me. That's not in me. I could never even think like that. Right. Um, so I felt so good about my healing up into getting pregnant. I'm like, you know what? I'm good. I am healed hallelujah, how did this happen? I feel like a whole complete person. I don't have any residual issues. Wow. I've, I'm amazing. I've done so much work. 
and then I get pregnant. Mm -hmm. And it's a whole flood of emotions and hormones. And I felt pretty good pregnant. Okay. I I love I I felt pretty sexy with my son, which was funny. Is that right? I felt like a yeah. complete cow both well, times. So it was just an illusion. And it must have been a coping mechanism because I gained 60 pounds. So. Oh, me too. <laughs> yeah, girl. What is happening? How These I other know. women gain like 20 pounds. You're like, what is happening? Yeah. I mean, my mom reminded me on a daily basis that she would only gain 15 to 25 pounds. And, and I just didn't care. Um, I felt really... It was so amazing because when I had my son, I knew that I wanted to have every first with him. So I stopped mm-hmm. working and he was my world. I had never known love like that. Mm-hmm. I felt tremendous, uh, unconditional compassion for him. And it was then that I realized, so up until this point, my mom was my hero. Mm. I never thought anything my mom did anything wrong Interesting. and then it's like I had a crisis all over again realizing that because my mom I feel bad because I love her dearly but the way I felt mm-hmm. and the way that she spoke to me it felt as if I had been a burden mm-hmm. she would say well I did all of this for you I sacrificed my whole life for you uh, I was a oh. single mother mm-hmm. you know these things that you don't think affect your kid, but they do. Yeah, don't say and, that. Right? Like if, if, if you're a mom out here listening, don't don't say that to your kid. It's so damaging. No, no you don't need to shame your kids. The world will shame them. And we guess don't what? Need- you <sighs> chose to have that kid, so suck it up. Yeah, just see them as a blessing. And I remember when I had Matthew, I thought I would do anything for this person And I would never make him pay for it. I would never make him feel like he owed me a cent or anything like my attention or calling him or anything like that. So that's when I started to realize, okay, so maybe my mom shouldn't be my hero. Maybe Mm. I need to reevaluate this whole situation. Maybe everything she said about my dad wasn't a hundred percent accurate. Right. And I started kind of working through those things. It was a really tough time for me. Mm -hmm. Just having a newborn baby, not sleeping, all of those things. And then think I had, it was, it didn't ramp up as much until I had my daughter, but I had a lot of the paranoia where I thought that something bad could happen to my kid. Got it. Um, I thought at all times, I just felt like I needed to be vigilant and I, and and I'm glad, I think that's a a good side effect, but at the same time, sometimes it was so all consuming that it was just overboard. I mean, if you know me, a lot of people that know me, if I'm at a park and there's a man sitting there or a woman that looks like they're just loitering and there's no child with them, I will go take a photo of that person. I will get in their face in not an mm-hmm. unkind way, but be like, who's your child? And I'm not embarrassed because yeah. I want to protect children. I feel this intense need to protect children. I understand that. Yeah. It was, I mean... We got pregnant pretty quickly. I didn't touch on the fact that I did have um, a miscarriage early in mar- in my marriage. Before um, Matthew? Mm-hmm. Right when we got married. So oh. it's it didn't hit me. It wasn't as tough for me except that I stopped taking birth control because the birth control is what caused the miscarriage. And I How did far have long were you when you miscarried? Twelve weeks. Oh my gosh, that's a that was that was far along. I didn't know I was pregnant though. Okay. So, and my period was so strange at that point in time. I was always, you know, pretty thin. Um, so I didn't know I ha- was even pregnant until I miscarried. It was super painful. Um, yeah. they had to do a DNC to yeah. just get the rest of the stuff out. Um, the baby Mm -hmm. I shouldn't say stuff. Um, But at that time, it was such a tumultuous time in our marriage Mm -hmm. that I was almost grateful, which is awful to say, but I I knew it. Yeah. yeah, I knew it wasn't the right time. So I really did want to be intentional about the timing. Right. For 
you know, for many reasons. Right. So when we did have Matthew, it felt really like the right thing in the right time. And we ended up moving back to Orange County and it was just fun, you know, being with a sweet little one-year-old and your husband and no other kids. <laughs> it was a fun time. And then I got pregnant with my daughter. Mm -hmm. So my son was one, just turned one and I got pregnant with my daughter. And that's kind of when all hell broke loose for me because I found out she was a girl Mm -hmm. And the nightmares began, the rape nightmares, the just trauma all over mm -hmm. again. My hormones were crazy. I didn't want to have my daughter. I didn't mm -hmm. want to keep her. I felt detached. I felt like she was, I would say to Matt, like, I feel like she's stealing my beauty. Mm -hmm. I would look in the mirror and just felt disgusting. Like never felt that way before. In most of my life, I never struggled with like the eating disorders or anything because I never cared. I never mm -hmm. cared what I looked like. I always felt indifferent to that feeling. And yeah. this was one of the first times that I was like, oh my God, I am disgusting. Mm -hmm. I am hideous. Like I hated my face. I hated every part of my body. It was so weird for me. And I know it was the hormones. What I didn't know at that time was that I was sick. Um... I had Hashimoto's, which is an autoimmune disease that affects your thyroid, and the thyroid mm -hmm. affects a lot of hormones, mm -hmm. and I had no idea. I had all the symptoms, the crawling skin, the severe depression, the anxiety, the joint pain, the weight gain, everything, but my doctor never tested me for it. She never even okay. tested my thyroid. Um, so I... Sorry, yes. Oh, no. I just think the symptoms mimicked pregnancy too closely. Got it. That, and maybe I didn't make a big enough stink about it. Well, that, when you're pregnant, I mean, it's easy to put blame everything on the pregnancy because yeah. everything feels weird anyways. Right. And um, <clears throat> I wanted to touch on, because it's, I just, I want to make sure that we hit this too, because I, I'm such a firm believer that the body really does hang on to the trauma and that um, the pain and all of that really manifests itself physically if it's not dealt with. So I wanted to get into your um, autoimmune um, issues. Yeah, because they, I mean, it's definitely a direct correlation. I had no yeah. idea. I was probably sick long before my daughter. I was probably um, sick with my son as well. It just hadn't started ramping up. Do you know the, what's interesting? Now that I'm thinking about it, my, so I had parathyroid tumors um, in my parathyroid glands. You have four mm -hmm. parathyroid glands. Yeah. Um, not my thyroid, but in my parathyroid. And I actually had emergency surgery up at UCLA. Anyways, long story, but it happened after my second baby. It happened yeah. when it was six months old. And I I have to believe that it's like when you have a baby, you are, your body is just under so much stress that like there it's going to come out. It's going to ooze out. There's going to be tumors of some kind. There's the depression, the anxiety. It's all manifesting itself. So it's interesting that it happened after your second child as well. Well, it's just a lot of hormones. And so it can speed up the illness. Mm -hmm. At least this is my understanding from talking to my doctors mm -hmm. and understanding my illness. Yeah. Um, I just remember not wanting to have my daughter, not feeling joy, which is anti just the opposite of my personality, right. not feeling myself and hating her and then feeling like something was really deeply wrong with her. I thought she was going to die. I thought something was wrong. Which my intuition was correct. Something was wrong with her, but I didn't, it wasn't everything that I thought. And I don't know if that was just paranoia or if really it was mother's what intuition. Was um, so she has a malformation of her kidney, which is a defect, a birth defect from being in utero of a, hu a person untreated with Hashimoto's stage three or beyond. No and way. yeah, so. The blessing in all of it is that her her malformation of her kidney is one of the least bad side effects. Got so it. there are way worse. Um, she has a duplex collecting system and vesicular reflux. So she has an extra tube on her kidney. 
and that extra ureter is um, sucking up waste from this valve that doesn't close and um, shoots up waste into this vacuum back into her kidneys. So oh. at all times, she is fighting a kidney infection. Wow. She had a flaming kidney infection in utero, which once again, my um, OB, Dr. Kent, missed. Um, I probably could never see this woman because I'm just like so traumatized from that situation. Um, she's, you know, a normal Newport Beach doctor and she did deliver the baby safely via C-section and I'm grateful for that, but it's still, she missed it. So in my 36 week ultrasound, the tech, I mean, it's a really well-known ultrasound place. Everyone goes there. And I remember him specifically saying as a doctor, oh, kidneys look great. And after birth, we had them go look back on those film, that film footage. And there is a huge, her, her right kidney is fully inflamed and gnarled and clear that she has a kidney infection. Mm. So I'm super sick. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, the way it was working at this point, I'm late stage three, maybe stage four um, of my Hashimoto's. My brain doesn't, didn't work. I had, it was like, imagine a timeline of your life and your thoughts just all out on a timeline spaced apart perfectly and organized so that you can put your thoughts in a row. Mm -hmm. Mine were just jumbled. Mm -hmm. And I was confused all of the time. I wasn't sure what reality was and what was just in my head. Mm -hmm. It was so nightmare. So is that what you still are currently battling is the Hashimoto stage three? No, I was diagnosed at, wasn't diagnosed until I was stage four. I was diagnosed in a thyroid storm. My thyroid is non-functioning. Um, it is completely burnt out. So I will be on hormone replacement therapy for the rest of my life. Okay. And unfortunately, if you have one autoimmune um, and they go untreated, you can get more. Okay. I have type one autoimmune hepatitis as well, which is a liver disease, which just okay. makes you kind of feel like you have the flu all the time. Mm-hmm. Um like body aches, yep. just kind of like a little bit dizzy um, and nauseous. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, my life is great. <laughs> well, okay, but hold on. So you, but you did have her and you adore her. Like you're at so, a point where, sorry. Uh, was, okay, so I have her, right? Mm-hmm. And I hated her. I resented her. I felt like she was the reason why I, and I, And this is a tough thing to talk about. Like it makes me want to cry because how could you feel that way about your child? But I know it's a reality that a lot of us moms have felt that we don't click necessarily right away. And it's like, we're not allowed to talk about it Mm -hmm. because it's not allowed. You're supposed to love your kids unconditionally. Mm -hmm. I didn't love her. She came Mm -hmm. out and I thought, She's keeping me from seeing my baby boy. Mm. I was all drugged up, drugged up, had a C section, Mm -hmm. and she was just a sickly little thing, but nobody knew. Mm -hmm. She was, I was in the hospital for five days, so depressed. My body wasn't healing, my scar wasn't healing, but I didn't know that I was suffering from an autoimmune disease. So your body can't heal from surgery when you have an autoimmune disease. And um, we were home for five days. And on day 10, I woke up in the middle of the night and she was next to me and she was on fire. And I felt her and I realized she had 104 fever when I took her temperature. So um, long story short, we took her to chalk. I took her to the hospital. Um, Because she was stiff as a board and making this weird moaning sound, they assumed that she had um, spinal meningitis. Mm -hmm. So they did a spinal on her, my 10 day old baby. I'm not recovered from my surgery, still on meds, Mm -hmm. super crazy, hallucinating. I was hallucinating a lot at this point. Um, it was, it was like, I was a shell of myself. Like when I hear my voice at this time or see my eyes, they were glazed over. I wasn't me. It was Mm -hmm. so weird. Um, the disease had really, really 
destroyed me. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know I was sick still. So we're in the hospital at Chalk. It took them an hour and a half to find the right size needle to put in my baby's spine. I'm screaming, crying outside of this glass, watching my little tiny baby. The good thing about this experience was that I started to love her. Mm -hmm. I started to feel for her because I had so much compassion. There was no way not to. Mm -hmm. Um, You can't see a child suffering Um, during the time in the hospital because they thought that after she didn't have spinal meningitis, they thought it was just a bladder infection. And so they put her on a round of antibiotics, which was the wrong round of antibiotics because she actually had Entrobacter, which is this bacteria in your system. And if you have a bladder infection from like poor cleaning, you would have E. coli in your system. So Mm. this is clearly from internal stuff Mm. going on. So we did the BCUG and all the, the horrible things that she had to endure to figure it all out. The tests, they're just so invasive and awful. And, um, and that's again where my, I lost my faith in God. Mm. I was so void of emotional strength and I was so separated from my normal self, the positivity that would keep me up during a hard time that I didn't yeah. know how to reconcile that this could happen Yeah, to my precious, sweet, innocent little baby. Right. Yeah. And I had to stay in these rooms with... They would, because it's not a contagious disease, they put you in with a roommate. So I had like this little cot. It was so dramatic. I feel like I have PTSD. Like whenever I go to chalk, I like my heart palpitates. Um, And they were so, they just didn't treat me well. They felt like I was this like, you know, this white snobby mom who wanted the best treatment for her child who just had a bladder infection. But Mm -hmm. around day five, when the mom, the nurses made their rounds again, they realized, oh, okay, this is like legit. She has this horrible thing. We hope she gets better. And they were nicer to me. But it was awful. I had to stay with these people that I was afraid they were going to kidnap my baby. All these Mm -hmm. roommates that I would have, they'd stay up all night. I didn't sleep. I slept like one hour a day. So I'm hallucinating. That's going to make anybody crazy. (laughs) Right, right. So I'm hallucinating. I'm super sick. It, It was... I didn't want to go to the bathroom. So I'm holding my pee. It was just awful. My stitches are pulling out and bleeding. Yeah, it's terrible. So bad. Um, um, but yes. so, okay. So I, I want to know how everybody's doing now. So how is everybody doing now? Like, where's your autoimmune issues? How are you treating them? How is your daughter? How is your marriage? I want to like kind of close this up. I want to, not that everything is, listen, healing is a, is not linear and life happens. And so things are always going to be hard, but like, you know. Um, well, it happens when you face the music and you realize, okay, something's wrong. We have to fix this. Um, I, I won't go into the details of all of the, you know, medical treatments that we've done with my daughter, but that is obviously a trial right. and that has been, it was something that I had to live for. I knew I had to survive for her. I yeah. had to change my diet. I had to change my lifestyle. And then I found out I had Hashimoto's, tried different medications, would have hand tremors. It was, it was a nightmare. Um, one time specifically, Matt remembers that he got a call from me and he had to come home because I heard a Chinese man chanting in each of our windows around our house. And I was like literally going crazy. I think my husband was nervous that I would never come back. Mm -hmm. And um, I was having suicidal thoughts. Mm -hmm. Through all of that, I now am feeling completely normal, sane hormonally. So that's a blessing. I can handle the physical pain of my injury, my illnesses Mm -hmm. because I also have, um, celiac disease, but, um, I can handle all that because I'm sane mentally. It was a road back to understanding that the Lord loved me and that he was there. Mm -hmm. I think I, I, I struggled with my faith because I felt like God, I went through so much as a kid And now this, like now you're going to hurt my child. Now you're going to make me be sick so that I can't take care of my children well. I felt a lot of guilt again, all over again, that I was a sick mom, that Mm. I wasn't a mom that they deserved. 
And yeah. part of why I live every single second of my life with my kids to, to the fullest is because there were so many days that I was in bed that I mm. couldn't even play with my kids. Yeah. And I had an angel babysitter who helped me. Mm. But until I was healed, I, I wasn't the mom I am today. And yeah. it was a long road to recovery. They say four years after with hormone replacement therapy, you start feeling pretty normal. And I am. Are I would say, four? yeah, I'm on four. I'm on like four and a half. Well, that is so promising. You know, I mean, imagine like how many years ago when there wasn't all of this um, advances in medicine, you know, I mean. No, I would have been sent to the loony bin. they would have been like and then i'd just die all my organs would have shut down and i would have been in a coma and they would have been like oh she was crazy she just was demon possessed or something like so i did have there was a lot of healing that had to happen i think inner healing and i had to re-heal my inner child Mm -hmm. i had to re-love myself Mm -hmm. give myself grace so i think um the main part that i wanted to talk about was having a daughter triggered all of this trauma yeah. all over again, which could have been why my Hashimoto sped up yeah. and attacked my thyroid um, because I had a daughter. You know, what's interesting and, is I feel the same exact way. I, I thought to myself, I could be a boy mom. I can't be a girl mom. And it's because I never, well, I mean, there was just so much abuse as a child, as a little girl that having a little girl, really brings all that back up. And it's like, it's, it's a lot. It's really scary. It's stuff that I have to talk to my husband about that. I feel awful about things that were uncontrollable. You have the trauma of sexual abuse. You have flashbacks. Um, Mm. anytime Mia was out of my sight and I heard her crying and my husband was with her, I had visions of him sticking his fingers in her vagina. Right. You were just having Right. So you bad. You assume the worst. You're, you're completely triggered and brought right back to that minute. But and my real, I yeah. knew in my heart, it wasn't like I believed it. It's I just, know. I couldn't control the thoughts. I couldn't yeah. control them. It was a because trigger. They, it was crying. Husband with baby. Husband must be doing something to baby. hundred percent. Yeah. yeah. And then no, it wasn't think we weren't thinking critically. Right. And then I keep going through all this healing. And then my daughter turns three and a half, which is when some of my first memories happen. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, okay, let's name all your body parts so that you know exactly how to prevent this. Let's talk about that really quick. Um, In terms of prevention, and I know that we can talk about this again on a different podcast, but um, in terms of prevention, like what I would love to talk about as moms and dads and caregivers of children, what would you say should have been done that would have prevented this from happening to you? First of all, if someone entrusts any like private information with you, if they say, hi, I think the way uncle Johnny touches me isn't good. You don't question them. You don't make them feel scared to tell you more. You kind of let them lead and you say, I'm so sorry you were touched in that way. You should have never been touched in that way. I believe you. Always believe a survivor. Mm. Always believe someone. Even if you don't, just say you do. Just say you believe them. And then they're more apt to share more. With kids, I think it's really important. And I know this. I wish I had all my notes in front of me because I've done talks on this. Um, And we could talk about it in the next podcast. It's so important that children are able to identify their body parts. Good. Very good. They yeah. Need to do you, know. Wait, you have a whole like outline. Maybe we should I do. do this on a different podcast. Okay. I have a whole thing on this okay. um, yes, because I'm very passionate about it. Prevention. Okay. Let's do that because honestly, I, that is, I mean, the pain, the amount of pain and trauma and how this pain and trauma has manifested itself because you weren't protected as a child, right? Like if we could protect children, um, man, how different their lives would be, the the lives of their friends, the lives of their children would be, right? So I'm all about prevention. So it's like, let's, you know, I I would love to- And I also want to, in in the next podcast, I will also talk about what to do if it's already happened. So I also want to give hope that if it has happened, 
um, how to handle that. Right. And how how to not re-injure and re-trauma, because I do believe that that secondary trauma can be so impactful to the psyche of a child, almost worse than the actual trauma. It's bad. Yeah. Okay. Listen, you know, we're going to stop here then because I mean, all right. Bye guys. We need to do a whole thing on that. Um, (laughs) Sorry. My stories keep going so long. What? (laughs) My stories keep going so long. No, it's perfect. It's beautiful. And I love it all. And I, I want to just make it, you know, I want, I, I want to make sure we talk and hit all the points, you know, so we'll do this another time, but Hey, all right. I, again, I'm so freaking proud of you. I think that thank you. This your story will never it, it will always be worth something because you're sharing it and I'm just ridiculously blessed by it. I'm so so proud of you, especially knowing one in 4 women have been sexually abused in their lifetime. So that being said, I know that there are people that are listening that absolutely identify and they can reach out to me or you. Um, and before yeah, we're here. super off topic, kind of, but, um, I was reading this thing and I'm specifically talking to the people that are listening, um, that podcasts live and die by reviews and subscribers and stuff like that. So if you haven't subscribed or like liked it or started or commented, will you do that? I, my, my, my hope is that the more people that a know, know that this resource is out there, the more people can yes. find open community. Um, so if you'll, if you would do that, that would be so fantastic. It might, you know, get out there more. Um, but thank you, Jen sharing. Thanks for, thank you for doing this or, or there for us. Thank you for doing this for us. And, um, for anyone that's going to listen. Okay. Bye, babe. Bye girl. Talk to you later. <laughs>